chapter fifteen of an anonymous story by anton chekhov translated by constance garnett eighteen sixty one to nineteen forty six this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifteen at venice i had an attack of pleurisy probably i had caught cold in the evening when we were rowing from the station to the hotel bauer i had to take to my bed and stay there for a fortnight every morning while i was ill zinaida fyodorovna came from her room to drink coffee with me and afterwards read aloud to me french and russian books of which we had bought a number at vienna these books were either long long familiar to me or else had no interest for me but i had the sound of a sweet kind voice beside me so that the meaning of all of them was summed up for me in the one thing i was not alone she would go out for a walk come back in her light grey dress her light straw hat gay warmed by the spring sun and sitting by my bed bending low down over me would tell me something about venice or read me those books and i was happy at night i was cold ill and dreary but by day i revelled in life i can find no better expression for it the brilliant warm sunshine beating in at the open windows and at the door upon the balcony the shouts below the splash of oars the tinkle of bells the prolonged boom of the cannon at midday and the feeling of perfect perfect freedom did wonders with me i felt as though i were growing strong broad wings which were bearing me god knows whither and what charm what joy at times at the thought that another life was so close to mine that i was the servant the guardian the friend the indispensable fellow-traveller of a creature young beautiful wealthy but weak lonely and insulted it is pleasant even to be ill when you know that there are people who are looking forward to your convalescence as to a holiday one day i heard her whispering behind the door with my doctor and then she came in to me with tear-stained eyes it was a bad sign but i was touched and there was a wonderful lightness in my heart but at last they allowed me to go out on the balcony the sunshine and the breeze from the sea caressed and fondled my sick body i looked down at the familiar gondolas which glide with feminine grace smoothly and majestically as though they were alive and felt all the luxury of this original fascinating civilization there was a smell of the sea some one was playing a stringed instrument and two voices were singing how delightful it was how unlike it was to that petersburg night when the wet snow was falling and beating so rudely on our faces if one looks straight across the canal one sees the sea and on the wide expanse towards the horizon the sun glittered on the water so dazzlingly that it hurt one's eyes to look at it my soul yearned towards that lovely sea which was so akin to me and to which i had given up my youth i longed to live to live and nothing more a fortnight later i began walking freely i loved to sit in the sun and to listen to the gondoliers without understanding them and for hours together to gaze at the little house where they said desdemona lived a naive mournful little house with a demure expression as light as lace so light that it looked as though one could lift it from its place with one hand i stood for a long time by the tomb of canova and could not take my eyes off the melancholy lion and in the palace of the doges i was always drawn to the corner where the portrait of the unhappy marino faliero was painted over with black it is fine to be an artist a poet a dramatist i thought but since that is not vouchsafed to me if only i could go in for mysticism if only i had a grain of some faith to add to the unruffled peace and serenity that fills the soul in the evening we ate oysters drank wine and went out in a gondola i remember our black gondola swayed softly in the same place while the water faintly gurgled under it here and there the reflection of the stars and the lights on the bank quivered and trembled not far from us in a gondola hung with coloured lanterns which were reflected in the water there were people singing the sounds of guitars of violins of mandolins of men's and women's voices were audible in the dark zinaida fyodorovna pale with a grave almost stern face was sitting beside me compressing her lips and clenching her hands she was thinking about something she did not stir an eyelash nor hear me her face her attitude and her fixed expressionless gaze 
and her incredibly miserable dreadful and icy cold memories and around her the gondolas the lights the music the song with its vigorous passionate cry of jammo jammo what contrasts in life when she sat like that with tightly clasped hands stony mournful i used to feel as though we were both characters in some novel in the old-fashioned style called the ill-fated the abandoned or something of the sort both of us she the ill-fated the abandoned and i the faithful devoted friend the dreamer and if you like it a superfluous man a failure capable of nothing but coughing and dreaming and perhaps sacrificing myself but who and what needed my sacrifices now and what had i to sacrifice indeed when we came in in the evening we always drank tea in her room and talked we did not shrink from touching on old unhealed wounds on the contrary for some reason i felt a positive pleasure in telling her about my life at orloff's or referring openly to relations which i knew and which could not have been concealed from me at moments i hated you i said to her when he was capricious condescending told you lies i marvelled how it was you did not see did not understand when it was all so clear you kissed his hands you knelt to him you flattered him when i kissed his hands and knelt to him i loved him she said blushing crimson can it have been so difficult to see through him a fine sphinx a sphinx indeed a kammer junker i reproach you for nothing god forbid i went on feeling i was coarse that i had not the tact the delicacy which are so essential when you have to do with a fellow-creature's soul in early days before i knew her i had not noticed this defect in myself but how could you fail to see what he was i went on speaking more softly and more diffidently however you mean to say you despise my past and you are right she said deeply stirred you belong to a special class of men who cannot be judged by ordinary standards your moral requirements are exceptionally rigorous and i understand you can't forgive things i understand you and if sometimes i say the opposite it doesn't mean that i look at things differently from you i speak the same old nonsense simply because i haven't had time yet to wear out my old clothes and prejudices i too hate and despise my past and orloff and my love what was that love it's positively absurd now she said going to the window and looking down at the canal all this love only clouds the conscience and confuses the mind the meaning of life is to be found only in one thing fighting to get one's heel on the vile head of the serpent and to crush it that's the meaning of life in that alone or in nothing i told her long stories of my past and described my really astounding adventures but of the change that had taken place in me i did not say one word she always listened to me with great attention and at interesting places she rubbed her hands as though vexed that it had not been her lot yet to experience such adventures such joys and terrors then she would suddenly fall to musing and retreat into herself and i could see from her face that she was not attending to me i closed the windows that looked out on the canal and asked whether we should not have the fire lighted no never mind i am not cold she said smiling listlessly i only feel weak do you know i fancy i have grown much wiser lately i have extraordinary original ideas now when i think of my past of my life then people in general in fact it is all summed up for me in the image of my stepmother coarse insolent soulless false depraved and a morphiomaniac too my father who was feeble and weak-willed married my mother for her money and drove her into consumption but his second wife my stepmother he loved passionately insanely what i had to put up with but what is the use of talking and so as i say it is all summed up in her image and it vexes me that my stepmother is dead i should like to meet her now why i don't know she answered with a laugh and a graceful movement of her head good night you must get well as soon as you are well we'll take up our work it's time to begin after i had said good night and had my hand on the door handle she said what do you think is polya still living there probably and i went off to my room so we spent a whole month one grey morning when we both stood at my window looking at the clouds which were moving up from the sea and at the darkening canal expecting every minute that it would pour with rain and when a thick narrow streak of rain covered the sea as though with a muslin veil we both felt suddenly dreary the same day we both set off for florence
End of chapter 15. Recording by Expatria in Bangor, Maine.